Now, since our message is that Christ has been raised from death, how can some of you say that the dead will not be raised to life? If that is true, it means that Christ was not raised. And if Christ has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. More than that, we're shown to be lying about God because we said that he raised Christ from death. But if it is true that the dead are not raised to life, then he did not raise Christ. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion, and you're still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in all the world. But the truth is that Christ has been raised from death as the guarantee that those who sleep in death will also be raised. For just as death came by means of a man, in the same way the rising from death comes by means of a man. For just as all people die because of their union with Adam, in the same way all will be raised to life because of their union with Christ. But each one will be raised in the right order. Christ first of all. Then at the time of his coming, those who belong to him. Then the end will come. Christ will overcome all spiritual rulers, authorities and powers Amen. and will hand over the kingdom to God the Father. For Christ must rule until God defeats all enemies and puts them under his feet. And the last enemy to be defeated will be death. For the scripture says, God put all things under his feet. It is clear, of course, that the words all things do not include God himself, who puts all things under Christ. But when all things have been placed under Christ's rule, then he himself, the Son, will place himself under God, who placed all things under him. And God will rule completely over all. Welcome to uh, part three uh, of your tour through the biblical feasts. Um, just a reminder for those who haven't been at every one, the first one was you looked at was the feast of Passover. And Passover prefigured uh, the death of Jesus and how we are saved by the blood of the Lamb that was shed on the cross, just in the same way that the Jews were saved when the Passover Lamb's blood was painted on the doorposts and the lintels of their houses. That changed our position. All who call on Jesus are going to be declared not guilty. We're going to be separated from our sins as far as the east is from the west. And we are all justified by his blood. So that was Passover. Then last week we looked at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which starts the day after Passover, if you remember, and lasts for seven days. And leaven or yeast in Judaism is a picture of sin. And so what we saw was that the eating of unleavened bread actually reminds people about their sin. And the piece of matzah, if you remember, that was pierced and striped for our sins, reminds us that Jesus is the sinless Messiah. Amen. That feast is something that helps to remind us that whilst our position has been changed and and praise God, Mark covered it again with the children today. What it doesn't do is actually deal with the issue of ongoing sin in our lives. 
our sins are forgiven in Jesus, but we're not expected to simply say, oh, well, you forgive everything, so I'll carry on sinning. You know, and I know, that that's not the idea. So what the Feast of First Fruits reminds us of is that at that moment that we accept Jesus, we are separated from our old lives and we look forward to a new life. And we are in that process, in that journey, of being changed from one degree of glory into another to become more like Jesus. So we're moving on, and this week we're going to look at the next feast in order, which is the Feast of First Fruits. And it begins on the normal Sabbath, that is the Saturday, um, after the, the um, Jewish people have celebrated Passover. But, uh, before we do that, I just actually want us to look at one or two things, which, which I think will help us to understand some of the, uh, the interpretations that I'm going to share with you about first fruits. I want us just to look briefly at a bit of church history. Now, for those of you who don't like history, you're thinking, oh no, this will be awful. <laughs> no, this is really interesting, honest. So, who founded the church? Obviously, you don't know the answer to that question. Okay, I'll try again. Who founded the church? Jesus. It's his church. He died for us. He died for his church. So the, G- the church was founded by Jesus, who was a Jew. His mother and father, earthly father, were Jews. He was born in Israel. He lived in a Jewish family. Scripture tells us he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was bar mitzvahed when he was 12. And at the age of 30, he became a Jewish rabbi And he says that his earthly ministry is to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. For 130 years, the church was virtually exclusively Jewish people. All the apostles were Jewish people. But gradually, as more and more Gentiles, like you and I, were drawn into the church, particularly by the teaching of Paul, then the number of Jews in the church diminished, the number of Gentiles increased, and until by 300, the year 325 AD, the church held what was called the Council of Nicaea. And at that point, under the influence of the Roman Empire uh, Emperor Constantine, the church rejected the Jewish people completely. It actually referred to them as Christ killers. And from that moment on, all the Christian feasts were separated from the Jewish feasts because the church wanted to have nothing more to do with the Jewish people. And that situation, my friends, continued for at least 1,500 years. The church became more and more anti-Semitic. It it not only excluded Jews, it actually murdered them. So the church at that time then was completely separated from its Jewish roots. And the understanding of the scriptures that comes through understanding that actually they were written by Jewish people about a Jewish person in living in a Jewish culture um, became lost. And translators and preachers had a restricted view and understanding of the word. Because they didn't understand the Jewish culture. And therefore there were things that, that were translated that Jesus had said that people said, I don't really, I don't really understand that. What was he talking about? Very often when he was doing that, he was talking in what's known as a Hebraism. It's, it's a normal way that Jewish people in their culture would talk. So if you take, for instance, um, Jesus said at one point um, about, in the middle of teaching about money, he, he actually refers to the fact that people have a bad eye. And people are thinking, why is he talking about having a bad eye? What's that all about? 
Well, it's just a Jewish phrase. If you've got a bad eye in, in the Hebrew understanding, you're mean. You are, you are not generous. So he was talking about money, so it was quite obvious that he would actually refer to people having bad eyes and good eyes, because that meant either being generous or uh, mean. So you see, if you just have a little bit of understanding sometimes about the language and the culture, it starts to make more sense to us. But around about the 1800s, theologians started to rediscover the Hebrew roots of the scriptures. Um, and, but it wasn't until later in the, in the 20th century that when Jews started to become believers in Jesus in a new way, that we suddenly had Jews and Jewish rabbis who were believers in Jesus who said, hang on a minute, you, you're not understanding that piece of scripture, you're not understanding that, because you didn't understand the Jewish culture you've been separated from, from all that time. Well, sadly, many churches in this country, not this one, thank God, have actually rejected that view. There is a, there is a move afoot called replacement theology, which actually says... All the promises in the Bible to the Jewish people are nothing to do with them. They're all for the church. The church has all those blessings, and guess what? The Jews can keep the curses. And there are many churches in this country that actually believe that that is true. It is, in fact, unbiblical, and it doesn't understand the nature of covenant. You see, our God is a covenant-making God. And he makes covenants that he doesn't break. And he has made covenantal promises to the Jewish people which he cannot and will not break. And as you track your way through these feasts, you're going to see just how faithful God is in that and how in the end times, all that, he's going to draw together. But that's a little bit further down the road. So, I want to emphasize that because... It's essential for Gentile believers that we don't misunderstand what's happening at this feast, the Feast of First Fruits. As usual, the institution of the feast is recorded in our Bibles in the book of Leviticus. Don't worry, we're just going to have a small bit from the book of Leviticus and it's nothing to do with boils. Right. <laughs> Speak to the children of Israel, says God, and say to them, when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Okay, okay so that's the biblical instruction. But actually, what we know about, and, and uh, it was mentioned again by Mark, thank God, is that this feast, just as Passover is connected with the, with the death of Jesus on the cross, so the Feast of First Fruits is linked to his resurrection. And we're going to look at three things that this feast reveals to us about the resurrection of Jesus. So we can just have those four questions up, please. So, Second one, thank you. We're going to look at these four questions regarding the resurrection and we're going to look at it from a Hebrew perspective. How long was Jesus in the tomb? When was he resurrected? How does that fit with the Feast of First Fruits? And then how might that apply to us? And remember, this is the test I want you to have in your mind. Does what you hear and understand today Make God greater and Jesus more wonderful. If he doesn't, reject it. That's what it's intended to do. Because what we're actually looking at over this period of time is not just the biblical feast. It's how Jesus fulfilled the biblical pre uh, feasts. Okay. So here's a question for you. Not a trick question. Well, it sort of is. But how long was Jesus in the tomb? How many? 
a few different answers, yes? Okay. The generally accepted number is three. He was three days in the tomb. That's the East tra Easter tradition. Uh, what, what we understand from our translation of the Bible is that Jesus was placed in the tomb on the Friday evening, round about six o'clock in the evening at, at the end of the day. Um, and he was there until when? Sunday morning, according to our translation of the Bible. He was raised on Sunday morning. Now, if you actually uh, read what, um, what Scripture says, that could be a bit of a problem. Because you see, that period of time is one and a half days. It's 36 hours. But what did Jesus actually tell his disciples about his resurrection? Well, in Matthew 12 and 39 and 40, he says this. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Amen. So Jesus is speaking prophetically about his resurrection. He tells us unequivocally he's going to be in the tomb for three days and three nights. That is 72 hours. Well, was Jesus right? Or have we somehow misunderstood the timing of all this? Who is the greatest prophet in the Bible who has ever lived? Jesus. Did he get things wrong when he prophesied? I don't believe he did. So how come the church has ended up with this misunderstanding that in fact Jesus is only in the ground for 36 hours and not the 72 hours that he predicted. Well, this takes us back to the separation of the church and the scriptures from its Jewish roots. You see, the scripture tells us that Jesus was raised, when? At the start of the first day of the week. That is, for us, sunrise on Sunday. But for the Jewish people... The first day of the week begins on Saturday evening at round about six o'clock. So, when was Jesus raised from the dead? Not Sunday morning, but Saturday evening at round about six o'clock. And why, you might say, why, why would the Jews have that odd, odd understanding about the days? Well, they take their days from Genesis. At creation, what does God say? Everything is made good, and it was evening and morning on the first day. In other words, the day starts in the evening by the Jewish understanding of God's creation and not in the morning. So, Jesus emerged from the tomb at the beginning of the first day of the week, that is Saturday evening, and if we then count back the 72 hours, the three days and three nights that he was in the tomb, we actually have him being placed in the tomb Wednesday evening at six o'clock in the evening. So why do we think that it was a Friday and not a Wednesday when Jesus was placed in the tomb? Well, again, it comes down to our, our forgetting about the celebration of the Sabbath. You see, the translators knew that Jesus was, had to be taken down from the cross, had to be placed in the tomb, because there was a Sabbath coming. And people say, oh, well, we know when the Jewish Sabbath is. It's on a Friday. So he must have been placed in the tomb on a Friday. No. And you and I know that. Because what? It comes the day after Passover, the start of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and what was that day? It was a holy Sabbath. That was the day that he had to be, they had to get him down from the cross before it started. Not the regular Jewish Sabbath, 
for this special Sabbath at the start of the first of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, what's the sequence? Jesus is crucified on the Wednesday. He's placed in the tomb. Nobody can go near the tomb on the Thursday because it's a high Sabbath. No work. Can't go anywhere. You just focus on God. On the next day, they can't get to the tomb because the soldiers are still guarding the tomb. The third day is the start of the regular Sabbath on the Friday evening. And then come the Saturday evening, the soldiers have run for it because they're frightened to death, because they've heard the stone start to roll away, and they get out of there fast. And the women are coming across Jerusalem at the end of the Sabbath and arriving in the garden, not in the morning, but in the evening. Have you ever wondered why it says that, they, that Mary didn't recognize Jesus? It's because it was dark. The sun had set by the time she got there. She was in the garden in the dark of the evening when she saw the risen Jesus. So, that means, if we take that understanding of it, that Jesus was absolutely correct in his prophecy about the sign of Jonah. He was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was there for 72 hours. But, I ask you, what then has that got to do with the Feast of First Fruits? Well, if we now look at how, by the time of Jesus, that scripture from Leviticus was actually put into practice, we will see the connection. You see, the Feast of First Fruits is celebrated on the, Sabbath, the normal Sabbath that comes after Passover. So that would have been Saturday evening, round about six o'clock in the evening. And what happened was, prior to that, the priests had, had planted in the Kidron Valley an area of barley. Because actually this feast celebrates the, partly the barley harvest. And at the first of feast, first, sorry, the feast of first fruits, the high priest and the other priests go from the temple in Jerusalem down into the Kidron Valley and there is this area of barley which is ripe for harvesting. So they have that first fruits harvested. They then process back up to the temple surrounded by thousands and thousands of pilgrims and when they get into the temple they shake off the the, uh, the, the heads of the barley, they are then burnt, because it says in the Leviticus there should be a burnt offering, and then they take the pieces of barley and they tie it into a sheaf. And they do what is known, and you heard it in the reading, a wave offering. What does a wave offering look like? That sheaf is waved to make a cross. They didn't know it, they didn't understand it, but they were commemorating the death of the Messiah. And so, folks, at the exact moment that on one side of Jerusalem, Jesus is emerging from the tomb and being raised from the dead, the high priest is on the other side of Jerusalem waving the first fruits of the harvest. And Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. But now Christ is risen, and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man death came, by man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so even in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterwards those who are at Christ's coming. In other words, 
accepting Jesus as the first fruit guarantees that the rest of the harvest is acceptable. Because that what was happening with the barley harvest. Those first fruits were offered to God and if God accepted them, the rest of the harvest would be blessed and accepted. So in Jesus, he is the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. But we, who follow after, are guaranteed that God has accepted Jesus' sacrifice for us. It's also interesting to note that in the account of the resurrection, there's something that puzzled me for a while in that account. When the disciples go into the tomb, according to John's Gospel, he says this, and there was a handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together and placed by itself. I never wondered why that little detail is there in the scripture. What's that about? Well, if we'd understood Jewish culture, we would understand what that was about. You see, if you went to somebody's house, and they offered you hospitality, a meal, a drink, or whatever else, you sat down, you spent time with them, if the wine wasn't very good, and the food was only average, and the hospitality really wasn't very good, when you'd finished the meal, you would take your napkin, screw it up, and drop it on the table. And the hospitality hosts would know, whoops, that's bad news. We didn't do that very well. They're not coming again. <laughs> However, if everything was okay, if the best had been offered, then you carefully folded the napkin and laid it down on the table. You see, in leaving that sign there, what Jesus was saying was, I am coming again. Amen. Amen. So, what's this got to do with us today uh, in Mansfield? Well, first of all, it confirms to us that Jesus was a prophet who actually accurately spoke about the resurrection. He got the timing exactly right and we can have confidence because if we read his other prophetic statements about his second coming, we can be sure that they are going to be fulfilled to the letter as well. Look, folks, we don't have to celebrate Good Wednesday. Sue and I still celebrate Easter in the normal way because that's our culture and tradition. Yes. The most important thing is Jesus died and he was resurrected. Yes. That's the heart of the gospel. That's what we believe. Yes. But the issue is, as a prophet... Did Jesus predict all that absolutely accurately? And the answer is yes. Amen. Secondly, it underlines for us that these biblical feasts that we read about do actually have a connection to Jesus. They are prophetically fulfilled through his ministry. And thirdly, it reinforces the idea given to the Jewish people that what that feast was about for them was offering the first fruits of their lives to God. You see, in Nehemiah 10 and verses 35 to 38, the people of God are reminded to, listen, bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of the fruit trees year by year into the house of the Lord, to bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, the firstborn of our herds and our flocks to the house of the Lord and our tithes to, of our land to the Levites. I don't believe God has changed that ordinance. You and I are the people of God. And we are instructed to bring our tithes 
and our offerings into the house of God so that he might use it. That is a tenth of our income. You see, so many Christians, I believe, have poor teaching on this. Our inclination is to spend all that we've got on living, on the things that we consider to be essential to us, and then after we've done that, if we've got some left over, we'll give it to God. That's not giving the first fruits of our lives to God. You see, for years, the church, I believe, has struggled because people have lost a clear understanding about the issue of giving first fruits. I was reminded of, of Sue's mum, bless her, who went to a, an Anglican church every week. And before she went, she would be rooting through her purse in order to find a 50p coin. Because that was what she gave regularly every week. Bless her. She didn't know that she was actually supposed to be giving the first fruits of her income to God. That she was supposed to be offering him the best that she had. Everything we have comes from God. Everything is because of his generosity. I'll tell you another interesting thing. You know it talks about God being righteous, Jesus being righteous, us being commanded to be righteous. I always thought that that meant, you know, being really proper, behaving yourself absolutely, you know. Then somebody might think I'm a bit righteous. It's not the understanding at all. The Hebrew word comes from another uh, Hebrew word, which is about the giving of alms. It's about generosity. Righteousness is generosity. Are we generous with our time and our resources to God? do we actually have a thinking in our head that says, I'm going to do that first, and then I'm going to sort out the rest. Because, you see, there is a biblical and a spiritual principle here. God cannot be outgiven. You get that right, and you will find that you are blessed by God in ways you never expected. Our experience since we, under, well actually, since we became believers, the church that we were in taught tithing, so we tithed since we've been believers. But, one of the lessons that we understood, we've had many of them over the years, um, I'll just give you an illustration of one of them. There was a, 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 um, a bookshop, a Christian bookshop, in Nottingham, uh, called the Mustard Seed. Some of you may have been to it or seen it, right. That shop was originally in Mapley. And um, Sue used to call in every night on, her, on a Friday night on her way back from, from work. She called in one night to find Howard who owned it saying, it's closing. I've run out of money. They put the rent up, we can't afford to stay here. I've got somewhere else to go, but I haven't got the money to do the move. So Sue said, well, we're going to do something about that because that's the kind of woman she is. So she came back and told me about it and we rang up our, uh, our Baptist pastor and said to him, our Christian bookshop is closing. We need to do something about it. Can we make an appeal in church of some money for him? Yes, said the pastor. Bless him. And on the Sunday, as we were driving to church, Sue said to me, it's all very well going and asking people to give some money to the bookshop. How are we going to know if it's enough? You know, what, 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 what's the test? What's the fleece? So, and I can't say I said this prayerfully. I just said, well, 500 pounds sound okay. She said, okay, 500 pounds. So, we go into the church, we make the appeal, and we make it very clear to people, we don't want money. What we want is a pledge 
to give some money because this is a test to see whether God wants the bookshop to, to move to this, these new premises. So we're standing at the back with our bucket and people are dropping the pledges into the bucket. And along comes a lovely old guy called Alan who had clearly misunderstood or not listened to what we'd said and came along with his five pound note in his hand. Now Sue was about to say to him, we're not taking money, but she looked at him and said, thank you Alan, very much indeed. Because she knew we'd be offended if we didn't take his money. And she popped it in her pocket. So we go home, get a cup of coffee, I tip all the pledges out on the table, I'm like, I'm like Scrooge, you know, counting through and adding up everything that's coming up. I add them all up and I say to Sue, well, you never guess how much we've got. She said, 500 pounds? I said, no. 495. She took the fiver out of the pocket and said, 500. That bookshop is the only Christian bookshop left in Nottingham. Hallelujah. It's still there. We went on to raise £15,000 for that church. You see, God cannot be outgiven. He sees your heart. And he knows where your heart's taking you. And he will bless and reward us when we do that. So, let's get our priorities right. Let's remember that the first um, the Feast of First Fruits is about genuinely demonstrating Jesus as a prophet, about fundamentally understanding that his resurrection was real and actual at the time that, the, uh, that this understanding of the Bible is. And, and just finally, just remember this. What does he say about what happens after First Fruits? You see, the first fruits are accepted and then the rest of the harvest is accepted. And it says about Jesus being raised as the first fruits from those who die because that's the promise to us as well. He says, those who die in Christ will also be raised with him. Amen. Have you ever thought what that means? You see, the Bible tells us quite clearly that when Jesus comes back for a second time, where's he coming back to? It's not New York, it's not London, it's Jerusalem. He's coming back to Jerusalem. And who's coming with him? We are. You think you won't see that? You will. That's his promise. The saints will return with him from the air. We will fly through the air and we will be in Jerusalem to see him ascend the throne and begin his thousand year rule friends that's the promise that's the promise and you'll hear more about that when you hear about the Feast of Tabernacles